All right, guys, welcome to our lecture this week. This week we're talking about evidence and patterns of evolution, and we're going to try to prove um, that evolution actually occurred. All right, so. All right, so we've already talked about how evolution occurs. Now we need to actually just prove that it occurs, which isn't that hard to do. There are four main things that we're going to look at when we prove that it occurs. The first thing we look at is fossils. Then we're going to look at the anatomy of organisms. We're going to then look at molecular proof, which would be like um, DNA, um, RNA, and proteins. Then we're going to look at the embryology, so how things are um, develop in the uterus. So when we think of this, I want you to notice that the first letter of each word spells out F-A-M-E. So it's a good acronym to use to remember the ways that we prove that evolution occurs. Next, we're going to look at the fossil record in more detail. So what you need to realize is fossils are going to be our most direct um, evidence that evolution occurred. All right, fossils show us actual change over time. If you look at the picture over here on the side, you can see that as we go up in it, the fossils that are shown change. All right, so fossils, fossils found in older rocks are different from ones found in newer rocks. So now we're switching to anatomical proof. Anatomical proof is body differences or changes that are shown in the fossil record. So we're kind of combining fossil proof with um, the shape of the body. There are three different things we look for here. We look for homologous structures, analogous structures, and vestigial structures. Are we supposed to do? So we're still under um, anatomical proof, and we're going to look at homologous structures particularly. All right. So when we talk about homologous structures, these are similar, but not exactly the same features that originated in a shared ancestor. So think of something that was older than these organisms, and they had that same structure as both of these organisms we're looking at. So like beaks on a bird, right? All birds have a beak. Their beaks are different, but they all have one right? Or four limbs of different animals, which is what this picture is down here. If you look, see this dark orange bone right here, right? We have one there, we have one there, we have one there, and we have one there. So all of these animals clearly had an ancestor that had that. Next, we're going to look at analogous structures. So they're different than homologous structures. For analogous structures, these are features that serve an identical function. So these things are going to do the same thing, and they look a little bit alike, but it's because the animals are going to live in a similar environment, right? So wings of a bird and wings of an insect. Now, if we think about it, right, they have wings because they both live in the air and they both fly. But like the wings and the insects, like this um, moth or whatever this guy is down here, right, his wing is almost see-through and it has like veins in it, whereas a wing of a bird is this one and it has bones in it. Does that make sense? So those wings are analogous structures because they aren't actually related to each other. It's because they live in a similar environment, so they needed those wings to survive. You could also look at the tail of a monkey and the tail of a squirrel, right? Both of those tails are used for balance, but monkeys and squirrels, monkeys are mammals. Well, squirrel's a mammal too, but it's a rodent, and a monkey is going to be a primate, all right? Um, another thing you can look at would be dolphin shape and shark shape. Right? They look really similar because they live in the water and you want to be streamlined to live in the water, right? but they're not actually related because one's a fish and one's a um, mammal. All right, lastly, under anatomical proof, we have vestigial structures. So vestigial structures are features that no longer seem to have a useful function. So like we have tailbones. We don't have tails, so why do we have a bone, right? Whales have tiny little hind legs like in this picture down here all right whales don't have legs but they still have like the pelvic bones in their body all right so even though these don't serve a function anymore they were there at one time for a reason so we believe that organisms with vestigial structures shared a common ancestor with the organisms that have those structures does that make sense Very cool. all right what we're looking at now is macromolecular proof. So we did um, F for fossils, A for anatomic, now we're M for macromolecular. When we do macromolecular proof, we're gonna look at the amino acid sequences in specific proteins of different species and see if they're similar. The more similar the proteins are, the more closely the species are related if you look at, for, at it from an evolutionary standpoint. So like humans have 95% of this 
this protein here, 95% they share with the rhesus mon monkey. And this is the amino acid sequence in the hemoglobin protein. All right, so we can see from that picture that the lamprey, right, which clearly doesn't even look like us, is the one we're least related to, whereas the rhesus monkey. All right, guys, so now we're talking about embryological proof. When we talk about embryological proof, what we're looking at is the early stages of vertebrate um, embryos that they're similar, okay? And I know these things are kind of weird and hard to tell what you're looking at, but if you look at the picture over here, okay, you can see that the gill slits are the little ridges and they all have tails all right so those are some similarities that if you look at the beginning pictures that's what they all have and if you look at the end pictures they've actually developed into things okay so we're done looking at the way we prove evolution now we want to look at different patterns um, or ways that evolution can happen there's three of them we're going to look at coevolution, convergent evolution and divergent evolution so first coevolution. now coevolution is when two species change um, due to natural selection but they kind of affect each other as they change so it says the change of two or more species in close association due to natural selection but an example would be like predator prey so as the prey gets faster the predators have to go faster too or they can't find anything to eat right or as um prey camouflage better right the predators have to get better sight because the ones with, it's not that they get to choose to have better sight, it's that the ones with better sight get to catch the animals so they get to eat, therefore they're stronger and more fit than the animal babies. Okay? Next is convergent evolution. Convergent evolution is when things appear to be similar, like sharks and dolphins, but they're not closely related. And now remember that we talked about sharks and dolphins earlier, right? We had said that they showed um, analogous structures. So, right, so the convergent evolution is going to lead to the formation of analogous structures. So what happens is they start out different, all right, and they come together, convergent evolution. So start out different, come together, because they live in the same environment. So if we look at the picture down there, we have a bat, this guy, we have a um, dinosaur, and a bird. All three very different, but they all have wings because they need those to live that's convergent evolution all right so the environment selects similar phenotypes even though their ancestral types were very different next is divergent evolution and that's when two or more related populations or species become more and more dissimilar because they live in different habitats so they start the same and they become different so they diverge they start the same become different this causes them to have homologous structures all right so divergent evolution homologous structures and then convergent evolution starts different and comes the same analogous structures there's two types of convergent evolution of divergent evolution i'm sorry that you need to know the first type is adaptive radiation all right and the second type is artificial selection so adaptive radiation is when many species come from one single ancestral species. So think of Darwin's finches. They started on the mainland, right? They got blown to the islands, and each island was slightly different, so they kind of adapted to that island. Natural selection took over, and a specific type or look of that bird took over on that island. That's adaptive radiation, where each island looked different from one another, but they started from one main species, all right? So this is divergence in response to different habitats. Whereas artificial selection, let well, me like that, is something that you guys know. This is when you breed things for specific phenotypes, all right? You're looking for specific characteristics. Humans do artificial selection. We speed up divergent evolution because we want things to look cute, right? We go for the cute puppy or we go for the really big Great Dane and we make two big Great Danes together to have an even bigger one. We do that, all right? so. All these are different types of evolution, right? We have fame to prove it, fossils, um, anat uh, anatomical proof, A would be anatomy, oh, sorry, fossils, anatomy, macromolecular, and embryological proof. And then we have the different types of evolution. We have coevolution, we have convergent evolution, and we have divergent evolution, all right? Um, if you have any questions, let me know.